All right. Well, let's get started this morning. I want to say thank you to Pastor Mike for that awesome intro and his love and his prayers. He's, he's a good man. I also want to thank him for the opportunity to be in the pulpit this morning. It is truly an honor, an honor today. And uh, like he said, my name is Peter Benson. I'm the youth pastor here at Holland First, and I love, love, love uh, this church. I love being here with you and just hearing and sharing in what God is doing in Holland, right? God is on the move. He is always up to something, and I like to be uh, right where God is. I want to be right in that sweet spot, following God, and I know you do too. Um, today, as Pastor Mike mentioned, I'm going to be uh, beginning a message entitled Weapons of Warfare. Weapons of Warfare, and we're going to take an in-depth look at spiritual warfare and talk about how can we be victorious in that. Um, before we dive in too far, I'd like to introduce our main text this morning. And so if you would stand with me as we read God's word, uh, we're going to dive right in. I'd like to begin today in 1 Peter chapter 5. Um, and I believe that this uh, will lead us and set the table for what, what, what God wants to say to us this morning. In 1 Peter chapter 5 and then starting in verse 6. It says this, it says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him, because he cares for you. Be alert and of a sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just come before you today. And God, as we study and observe this topic of spiritual warfare, God, I pray that your spirit would be right here with us. That it, he would be in control of my heart and in the control of my mind. Father God, that your spirit would be leading the service. And God, that all of our hearts would be open to whatever it is you want to say to us. God, that you would be moving. We thank you for it and give you praise in Jesus' name. And all God's people said... Amen and amen. You may be seated in the house today. Just want to make a quick note that um, our junior high, we're going to hang right here today um, because of everything that's going on and because I'm preaching. We're going to hear the word together this morning. Um, but I wanted to start off by giving you some really good news. You guys ready for some good news? All right. You might. Don't start throwing papers at me. But here's your good news this morning that in your life, you are going to find yourself at some point coming up against adversity in some sort of spiritual battle. Pete, you said this was good news. Just wait, okay? You are going to find yourself coming up against some sort of struggle, temptation, attack, or conflict. And it's going to seem like you're just going about your life, minding your own business, and then boom, you find yourself in the middle of a spiritual battle or a giant conflict or what have you. And we think to ourselves, we think, man, God, what's going on? Why am I having this kind of trouble in my life? You know, God, I, I pray. I'm a Christian. I've accepted you. I love you. God, I'm, I'm a tither. You know, I've done, I've, I tried to check all of the boxes, God, but God, why now am I having trouble? This seems to be out of nowhere. And we ask, our, we, sometimes we even ask ourselves, God, where are you? Where are you? I've tried my best to follow you. What I want to tell you this morning is the first step to being successful in a spiritual battle is to realize that you're actually in a battle. Make no mistake about it, guys. You are fighting a spiritual battle against a very real enemy. And I think as Christians, sometimes we get so caught up in the busyness of our life that we forget that we are in this battle. 
We get distracted and we forget to be alert and be on guard against the attacks that come. We get so distracted and we get off mission. And when we pray prayers of God, why am I struggling? God, where are you? God, are you, do you even care? God gently reminds us, my child, it is because you are in a spiritual battle. I, I love you. My child, I love you, but in this life, you will have hardship. He never promised us a life void of struggle. In fact, he's come right out and told us the exact opposite many times. That guess what? We are going to have struggles and trials and hardships and attacks that come against us. In 1 Peter 4, just one chapter previous to the, our opening text, uh, Peter writes this. He says, Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you. As though something strange is happening to you. Like, whoa, where's this coming from? He says, don't be surprised, but rejoice in as much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ. So that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed. For the spirit of glory of God rests on you. Whenever you struggle, church, whenever you struggle, God's hand is upon you. And he is with you right in the middle of that battle. And we shouldn't be shocked at the fact that we're in a battle, but we can rejoice that we know God is with us right there. I told you I had some good news for you this morning. And the good news is, is when you struggle, God is with you. His hand is upon you. His spirit's all over you. You are not alone. He's not saying, hey, you should freak out. You're in trouble. He's saying, hey, don't freak out. Know that it's going to come at you, but rejoice because I am with you in that struggle. And I am giving you the power and the ability to overcome and to be successful. That's the good news this morning. You see, we should expect opposition, but take joy that God is with us in giving us that victory. You know, Christ himself battled against Satan, didn't he? He endured and battled against everything that we endure and battle against, and then some. He was tempted by Satan. The Bible tells us, gives us the account. And when Satan found out that Jesus was incorruptible, that he could not corrupt who Jesus was, he used the people in the church to try to attack him. Who was the, the greatest persecutor of Jesus besides Satan? It was the church coming against him. And he used them to try to discredit Jesus and his message of hope for the world. But when they found out that A, he was incorruptible, and that B, you can't discredit him, what did Satan then do? He turned and he tried to attack his flesh by killing him on the cross. And guess what? That death on the cross is the very victory that we all rejoice in today, isn't it? Everything the enemy tries to do ends up just digging a deeper pit of judgment for himself. Because even unto death, we are victorious this morning. Amen. In my death and in Christ's death, I still win every single time. And that's why we ought to rejoice. Rejoice. In John 16, Jesus told us something. He says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble. He says, but take heart, I have overcome the world. We can have peace knowing that Jesus has already won the battle. We can expect to still have to fight, but know that as we are fighting, we are fighting a defeated foe. And I don't know about you, but knowing Jesus has already fought this battle gives me encouragement, it gives me peace, and it gives me strength. We know we're going to have trouble, but we can have peace as we face it. We fight in a different way. And I'm here to tell you that having peace is a powerful weapon 
in your arsenal as you fight your spiritual battles. The enemy wants to rob your peace because he knows it makes you weaker. He knows that if he could take your peace and give you fear, you're weaker. But Jesus said, I have come that you may have peace. I may come so you can have life. He is the prince of peace. And having peace in the battle, man, it's like a slap in the face to the enemy. We can stand strong knowing that even unto death that we win. Having that mindset while we fight gives us victory. We need to realize that we are in a battle. Now let me take you back to the first verse in our main text this morning in 1 Peter 5, starting in verse 6, where it says, Humble yourself, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. I want to talk to you about that word, humble yourselves. Humble yourselves. He is calling us to step out of our own ego this morning and realize if Jesus Christ, the God-man, suffered and had to fight, then we also are going to have to suffer some and fight some. Amen? We are being enlisted this morning. We need to set aside our ego and think and stop thinking that we are somewhat so special that we're not going to have any problem in our life. We have to have this mindset of humility. Humility is a great weapon. Realizing that, hey, I'm not greater than Christ. I am going to have to fight. And realizing that, you know what? It's not my strength that I'm going to fight in. It's Christ's strength that I fight in. I am not good enough to overcome the enemy. The enemy does not shudder at my name. But guess what? He shudders at Christ's name. And when I come under his authority, then I get to walk in his power. And the enemy has to flee and run from us. Because we have humbled ourselves and submitted ourselves to God. That is a powerful weapon in your arsenal. So we need to choose to fight this good fight. And by humbling ourselves, we choose to set aside our own agenda. We set aside our own pleasures and comforts. And we submit to God's will. And we choose to fight the good fight under his authority. But some of us, we just want to stay out of the fight. We think that we can be a Christian and somehow we can stay out of this battle, this spiritual warfare that's happening, being waged over the world. We think that we can stay out of it and we can become content with our own salvation. Now that is a dangerous concept, a dangerous thing to think about. God, I, it's good enough that I'm saved. I'm gonna try to stay out of this battle that's being waged against this world. That is a, a, a mindset that has plagued the church and it's the exact opposite of God's heart for people. You see, we have to choose to stand and to fight. We can't just stay out of it. There's no staying out of it for you if you are a Christian. You can't walk away. You know what they call a soldier in the army who runs from battle? What do they call him? A deserter, a deserter. Let me read to you the definition of a deserter. A soldier or draftee who leaves and runs away from service or duty with the intention of never returning. It also says it's a person who, who fails to uphold a cause or who abandons someone else, especially in violation of a promise or obligation. Did you know that you have been drafted as a soldier into God's army? And if we think that we can stay out of this battle somehow, that we don't need to fight this fight, that we can just, oh, I'm good, I'm good. God, thanks for my salvation. I hope everybody else gets it right. We are like that deserter who runs away. God does not want us to be deserters this morning. Don't buy into the lie that you can stay out of the fight. This battle will be brought to your doorstep whether you like it or not. It'll be fought in your heart, your mind, and everywhere you go. I wish I could stand up here and tell you that once you accept Christ, your life is just gonna be peachy. And I'm sure there are preachers out there who will lead you to believe that. But that is not the case. That mindset will only set you up for failure. And when trouble does come to your door, those are the ones saying, God, don't you even love me? Are you even there? Because they thought they could just stay out of the battle. But you can't. 
it will find you. And I know that, hey, that can seem a little discouraging. But in verse 6, it says, it tells us that God will lift you up in due time. In due time. See, there's a promise that a time will come where you won't have to battle anymore, but that time is not yet. Yes, the battle is won, the victory is certain, but we are going to have to battle for a moment, but that's only for a moment because in due time, God himself will lift you up. See, we have hope, don't we? We have hope, and hope is a powerful weapon against the enemy. We have our hope in Christ, that we can trust him, that he loves us, and that we are going to be with him in time. And so whatever happens here doesn't matter as much as what we know we're hoping for, which is eternity with Christ. That's why even Pastor Mike said this morning, as we grieve, we we don't grieve as those who have no hope. We have hope, because even in death, we are victorious. And so don't get, so like when someone you love dies, okay, this is oftentimes a time where people are like, God, where are you? You're not here. But don't have that mindset. Know that even in death, when you are a Christian, that is the final victory. Satan, he doesn't win. You know what? You might say, well, it looks like a win because he's not, that person isn't here anymore. But that's not true. If they have Christ, it's a win for Christ's kingdom, amen? Because they are uh, with him, having fellowship with him, worshiping him, and seeing their their due time being fulfilled for them, amen? So have hope this morning. Verse 7, it says, cast all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. You see, the enemy wants to come at you with worry and fear and discouragement. But Jesus says, as you're fighting this battle, know, number one, that you're going to fight it. Okay? I'm fighting a battle. Okay? Everybody say, I'm fighting a battle. Okay? Know that you're going to fight. But as you fight, know that he's with you and that we can cast our anxieties on him. I, being, being a, a youth minister, I see so many students battling with anxieties. And for some, you know, it is a medical thing and they do need help. Like we have to care for our carnal flesh in such a way that, you know, medicine is given to help us, right? But there's also a spiritual component. I'm not saying throw the one out and only this, but I'm saying don't do this and forget this. You guys with me today? Because so many students today, their anxieties are just at such a high level. And Christ is saying, look, students, people of all ages. And I know this isn't just the youth, but that's my area where I focus on the most. But he's saying, those of you who struggle with anxiety, if you need to take something, take something. There's no shame or harm in that. We care for our body as it needs it, right? If we have a Band-Aid or if we have a cut, we'll put a Band-Aid on it, right? But he's also saying, don't forget the spiritual aspect of that as well. That we could cast our anxieties onto God because he can carry them. He's tough enough to take it. He's strong enough to pick them up and help you move. As you're fighting this morning, put your trust in him and say, you know what? I'm not going to freak out. My life is not upside down. I am not going to be swallowed up by whatever I'm facing because I serve a big God and I can give it to him. And he's strong enough to carry it for you this morning. Cast your anxieties on God. No, don't think, no, that in the end you win. Sometimes when I'm facing something really, really tough in my life, I immediately go to the worst case scenario. I say, what's the worst that can happen? Well, I lose all my money. Everything falls apart. Everything's all, all done. Guess what? I still have Jesus. God's still on the throne. I still have hope for a future that God has a plan for me. And that in a moment, God can turn it all around. And so that gives me peace in that battle, knowing that, hey, even if the devil throws his worst at me, even if I have, you know, a disease and I am going to die, guess what? God still loves me. I'm going to have a home in heaven. He is victorious. Satan is a defeated foe. And that gives me victory. And that is a powerful weapon against the enemy. What more can he do to you? He can throw his best at you, but when our hope is in God, it's nothing. It comes to nothing because we win. So he asks us to cast your anxiety on him. 
So the first thing was to recognize you're in a battle and have the mindset that I'm gonna fight, but I'm gonna fight victoriously. And the second thing I want to help you do this morning as you fight the spiritual battle is identify your enemy. Who are you fighting against? You must understand and develop an understanding of your enemy. Then you can more easily defeat them. So the question I'm going to ask you right now is, who are you fighting against? Who is your enemy? Well, number one, we know And the most obvious one, right, is Satan. We know we're fighting against Satan. 1 Peter 5, 8 says, Be alert of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Let's talk about the call to be alert and of sober mind. That means that we're standing guard, okay? We're not sitting around idle with our armor somewhere far from us, and then all of a sudden we get caught off guard. Ah, I'm being attacked. No, we are alert and of sober mind, realizing he is out there and he is after not only you, but the church as a whole. He wants to create separation between what God loves. He wants to separate it. So we need to be aware that that is happening and be alert. But the enemy Satan, he has waged war against God's beloved creation. Ephesians 6, 10 and 12 says, finally in verse 10, he says, finally be strong in the Lord and his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the schemes of the devil, the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. We're warned, guys, that Satan is trying to establish his kingdom of darkness here on earth. The Bible first describes Satan in Genesis as the craftiest and most cunning creature in in the garden. He was a cold serpent bent on evil. He tricked Adam and Eve into committing the first sin. We later find out that he was a beautiful archangel clothed in splendor. But because of his pride and his own beauty, he sought to be greater than God and was cast down from heaven along with a third of heaven's angels. We see that in Job, God God allows him to go to and fro on the earth and even attack and work on this earth. He's given permission that he is trying to establish this kingdom of darkness. But we serve Christ in his kingdom. 1 John 5, 9 says that we know that we are children of God and that the whole world is under control of the evil one. Those who um, are not on guard, those who are not alert, those who are not fighting this battle right, you know, have yielded control over their minds and their hearts to Satan, and he is at work in the world, right? And when you are spiritually dead, you don't even know how you're being used of Satan, but he is at work. But this authority here on this earth is only temporary, and Satan knows that his time is limited, and that on the final day, his judgment is going to come. But he and his demonic army at work on this earth are organizing. Have you ever wondered who is the mastermind behind all the evil and perversion that we see in our age? It seems like every time I turn on a um, TV program, I, I don't use cable, but I mean, I'm like all the commercials, every single one of them. I'm like, what is going on? Who is sitting around saying this agenda needs to be pushed like this? I don't really think it's always the government have their hands in the, in the TV. You know, it's the, there's an organ, there seems to just be like this organization to all this evil, right? And perversion. Where's it coming from, right? Satan is trying to establish his kingdom here on earth. He's trying to set it up. And, and we can see it at work. And it's demonic. It is evil. It is void of life. It is a perversion of God's truth. And it's happening. And we are called to take a stand against this kingdom. Against this foe. Standing in God's mighty power. You know, the Bible tells us that the enemy, Satan, he is a thief. He's come to steal, to kill, and destroy. He wants to steal your identity as a child of God. He wants to kill your flesh and to destroy your relationship with God. So that's our enemy. 
But I'm here to tell you this morning that although that's a very real adversary that we do face on a daily basis, that is not the only adversary that you have. There is another one. There's another adversary that your spirit man battles against. And that's the second enemy I want to talk to you about this morning. And that is your own sin nature. Too often we give our defeated foe far too much credit. (laughs) You know, the Bible says he prowls around like a lion. He's not the lion, but he prowls around like him. And he, he's trying to take you out. But sometimes we're like, oh, this devil got me today when we just gave in to our own sinful desire. You guys hear me this morning? Your spirit man is also in a battle, not only against Satan in his dominion of darkness that he's trying to establish on this world, but also against your carnal flesh that longs after that kingdom. You hear what I'm saying? And we have to be mindful that it's not only Satan that we're battling against, but our own selfish and carnal desires of our flesh. Galatians 5, 13 and 17 says, You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled, keeping this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out, or you will be, or you will be destroyed by each other. Verse 16, so I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. You see, we get this picture that my flesh is wanting to follow Satan, right? And to join this kingdom of darkness. But because we, our spirits have been made alive in Christ, we no longer follow after that. We follow after Christ in his kingdom of light. And that is who we, we follow. But Satan knows that our flesh is bent towards the other way. And so he often comes and appeals to your flesh and tries to partner with it to keep you from following after God's kingdom. You are in a battle against Satan and your own sin nature. And if we don't stop and acknowledge the fact that sometimes I just need to crucify my flesh and not say, Satan, you're behind this all. No, my flesh just desires what is wrong. I need to kill it. And put it to death. And the good news is, let me give you some even best news this morning, is that both Satan and your flesh are easily defeated. Easily defeated. In fact, the battle is already won. We just have to walk it out. Right? We just have to walk in it and and choose to fight. Because we're fighting against two adversaries. Ephesians 2, uh, 1 through 2 says this. As for you talking about us who are in Christ. It says, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. You see, he's working in trying to control people by appealing to people's flesh and their carnal desires. They want to work together. But to to long after that thing is to long after what's dying and temporary. The the joy that you may find fulfilling your selfish gratifications of your flesh, those joys that you might find there are a false joy. Christ offers you something so much better. You know, it's like, you ever heard the term a short-term gain, long-term loss? You know, that's what sin is. It's like, oh, I get this pleasure right away. Yay. But in the end, it costs you your soul. But when you follow after Christ, you're like, you say no to yourself right away. You don't get that instant gratification per se, but we are playing the long game of eternity. And I'd rather be good in eternity and lose in the short than win in the short and lose in the eternity. You hear what I'm saying this morning? You know, we want to follow after Christ because God's always thinking about eternity because he's outside of time. He says this little bit of short, tiny time doesn't matter. The only thing you have to get right in this time is Jesus and have him in your heart. Then you win the battle forever. And that's what we're living to do. And we don't want to follow after Satan in his darkness. 
And I want to say this with all the love. Sometimes it's just a matter of killing your flesh. Yes, the devil may tempt you, but you are the one who gives in. Upon salvation in Christ, your spirit is no longer serving that kingdom of darkness, and it's your spirit man who must fight. Satan, this is in your notes, Satan can't make you sin or stumble. He can only provide you with the opportunity to sin. He brings, you, brings an external battle to you. And we are the ones who choose to act or not act on it. That's why we're held accountable for the sins that we commit, right? It's because we have a choice to give in to that or not to give in to that. And God is saying, don't give in. You have not been called to give in to those desires. You must crucify your flesh, flesh knowing that I have something so much better and so more long lasting than that for you. Don't give in to this petty, small pleasures of this world. And just as he did to Jesus, Satan's gonna come to you and he's gonna see if you are corruptible. And he's gonna try to get you to trade your um, sonship with God and entice you with these worldly pleasures to see if you're gonna give in. See if you're corruptible. It's a false joy. And for many, that's enough. For many, when he waves the, the enticing, sinful stuff in front of, under your nose, many give in right away. And those are those who have not crucified their flesh fully yet, who have not learned to walk in the Spirit yet. We don't do it perfectly all the time, but, you know, we learn to walk in victory. And we've got to break the cycle of, ooh, sin. Ooh, sin. Right? We have to learn to see it and be like, in the name of Jesus, no. This is only leading me to my death. And he's going to come and see if you're corruptible. And after he, you know, tests you to see if you're corruptible, if he can't get you to sin, he's going to attack you emotionally and try to steal your peace. Because, as I said, it makes you weaker. He wants to feed lies into your mind through others or by attacking your peace through a situation or get you in some way to question God's goodness and his involvement in your life. And for many, afflictions, persecution, hardship is enough to make people mad at God and to fall away. But when we know that that's what he's trying to do, oh, this situation is only an attack from the enemy. He's only trying to get me to say, God, you don't love me, God, it's all over. Oh my goodness, I'm gonna die, okay? If we're like, no, that's just the enemy trying to get our eyes off of God, we can look at him and be like, good try, Pfft, that's a joke. My God is so much bigger than you and bigger than this. You're not going to steal my peace because of a momentary affliction. In due time, my God will lift me up. In due time. Like I said earlier, if he can't get you to sin and he can't steal your peace, then he's going to try to take you out. He's going to try to take you out and attack your flesh. But guess what? We already acknowledged this morning that even in death we win. Even in death we are victorious. And so we're not going to exchange God's truth for Satan's lies this morning, are we? Never exchange God's truth and what he says for Satan's lies. That's half of the battle right there, isn't it? He's wanting you to believe that everything's all messed up and you're going to lose. But if we just stand strong on God's word and take our stand against the enemy, what more can he really do to us? Oh, you're going to kill me? Thank you. I'm going to go to heaven. Whew, this has been hard. I'm ready to go. Thank you, Jesus. Right? He can't do nothing to you if you choose to fight. But we need to be on guard. We need to be on guard. Ephesians 6, 13 through 20 says, Therefore, put on the full armor of God. See, we're going to talk about some weapons that we possess. And where did these weapons come from? Did I make them? Where did they come from? Right? They come from God, the full armor, so that when the day of evil comes, when you're fighting the battle, when he's attacking you, you may be able to stand your ground. Meaning God's given us something that it's enabled us to stand our ground. And then after you have done everything to stand, we're going to keep standing. Stand firm then 
with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up your shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert. Be on guard, be alert. He says, always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Pray also for me that whenever I speak words may be given to me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. That's saying pray for your pastor. Pray for your pastor. The enemy wants to take them out because God uses them to encourage you. So he's saying pray for your pastor Pastor Mike, so that he may fearlessly be about God's business. That one's for free. Verse 20, for which I am an ambassador in change. Pray that I declare it fearlessly as I should. Number one, let's talk about your, your, your weapons again, right? So we've talked about mindset. We've talked about standing. We've talked about being alert. And number one is just simply stand in God's strength, in his strength. He gives us the armor. Have the mindset, yes, I am going to fight, and I'm not going to do it on my own because I'm not strong. But thank God, God is strong. And because of the spirit of the Most High living in me, I'm going to extend, uh, stand against the attacks and be victorious. You have the spirit of the Most High God living in you. That means something amazing. That means that we have available to us all of God's authority and power through Christ Jesus and the spirit that dwells within us, we can take our stand, right? You know, don't let your flesh be the strongest thing in you. Let your spirit be the strongest thing in you and whatever you feed will be the strongest, right? So if you're all the time only ever feeding your flesh, then your flesh is gonna win when temptation comes. But if you're all the time feeding your spirit, when the temptation comes, your spirit's gonna say, I do not want that, I want God, right? Feed your spirit, take your stand. Let's talk about the belt of truth this morning. That's your second piece of armor. That's your second weapon in your arsenal. Satan wants you to exchange the truth about who you are for Satan's lies and his perverted truth. He will always come at you with something that sounds like the truth, but it's perverted slightly in a way as to trick you into believing a lie. We need to have the truth of God's word so ingrained in us that we can spot the counterfeit. We have God's word. Let his truth, the truth about what God says about you, about this fight, about the enemy, let God's word be the thing that holds your life together. Bind it all up with the truth of God. You see, whenever I'm feeling insecure, I can say, I don't feel like I'm on solid ground, but I'm gonna step on God's word, and that is solid, and that is firm, and that holds my life together, and I don't have to be in fear. I don't have to be defeated because of what Christ has done. Number three, the blessed prey of righteousness. The piece of armor, this is meant to guard your heart, right? It's the most vital part in you. If you want to kill something, shoot it in the heart. We are to guard our hearts in a spiritual sense. Your heart is your inner man. And we aren't to leave our hearts exposed. We must be on guard. I want to read to you a beautiful portion of Scripture. I think talks about this topic so beautifully in Proverbs 4, 20 through 25. It says, My son, pay attention to what I say. Turn your ear to my words. I just picture God saying this. Do not let them out of your sight. Keep them within your heart. For they are life to those who find them and health to one's whole body. Above all else, guard your heart. For everything you do flows from it. Keep your mouth free of perversity. Keep Corrupt talk far from your lips. Let your eyes look straight ahead and fix your gaze directly before you. We guard our heart by staying pure. 
And when my righteousness is not enough, which is most of the time, I put on Christ's righteousness to guard my heart. I clothe myself in the righteousness of God, in the things of God. I put that over me to protect my heart and my inner man. And I do not allow the other stuff to get in there and to penetrate my heart. And so what does that mean for us in a practical sense when we're in this battle? That means <clears throat> you need to guard yourself, right? So many of us, in our weakness, we leave the door open to, uh, to the enemy. And he can come in and appeal with the sin and we just give in to it. We're enticed into it. But he's saying, don't leave that door open. Don't even give them that opportunity. Clothe yourselves with the righteousness of God. And that will protect your heart from being corrupted by the lies of the enemy. You need to guard your heart. Number four, we are to fit our feet with the readiness of the gospel of peace. Ephesians 15. Then in Proverbs 4, 26, if I read on in that scripture I just read you, I read you 20 through 25, let me read you 26 through 27. It says, give careful thought to the paths of your feet and be steadfast in all your ways. Do not look to the right or to the left. Keep your foot from evil. When the enemy comes to attack you, we need to flee from the temptation, flee from the evil. We don't want our feet to be quick to rush into evil. We want them to be quick to run to the, to the cross and to God and, and to run away. And then we have the gospel of peace. What's the gospel, the good news that Jesus Christ died for us? When that's fitted on our feet, we get to tread upon serpents and scorpions. And all, all of his lesser demons and evil cohorts, we get to kick them and stomp them and hit them with the gospel, man. Knock them over, man. Don't let them get you down. Tread over him. You are under my feet. You guys remember that song? I just want to sing Romans 6. Yeah, yeah. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to sing it. Y'all know it, right? But I just want to step on a man because he's under my feet. He's nothing to me. Nothing. When you need something firm to stand on, stand on God's word. Number five, take up the shield of faith. The shield of faith. We need to take God at his word and believe in our heart and not doubt that he is who he says he is. He's going to do what he says he's going to do. And that Christ died on the cross and three days later he rose again. And that everybody who believes in him will be saved. Right? We have faith in Jesus. And so if we hold that up, no matter what comes at us, they're not getting through that. That is impenetrable. And so as we fight, we fight from behind of our identity and faith in the child of God. And we're just pushing forward. And it doesn't matter what's pushing back because Christ always wins. He has the final authority. And so push back, guys, with your faith that God is going to come through. That's where the peace and the hope comes from. God will come through. Your faith in Christ is a shield. Let's take it up. Isaiah 54, 17 tells us that we have faith. It says, no weapon of form you, formed against you shall prosper, and every tongue which rises against you in judgment you shall condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness, where does it come from? From him, says the Lord. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. So what does that mean? When you're being attacked, it's not going to prosper. It's not going to win. Amen? I love fighting my battles that way. Like, oh, coming at me? You're not going to prosper. I'm going to win. Take the helmet of salvation, number six. The helmet of salvation. I already told you we have to have the right mindset. And we need to protect what goes in and out of our minds. Do not allow the enemies to creep in and rob you of your salvation. 2 Corinthians 10.5 says, We demolish the arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. We demolish that. And we take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. Do not let the enemy have free reign in your mind. Right? We need to keep God's word in our mind. And that will protect us from believing lies. 
Protect your mind. Sometimes the battle he's waging is in your mind. Trying to get you to get off course in your mind. But if we have the helmet of salvation on and we are fighting that good fight, we will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Come on now. We know that. We know that. But in the moment of hardship, remember the truth. Right? Remember the truth. And if we're on guard, we're not going to be like, oh, oh my goodness. Right? If we're on guard, that's not going to happen. We're going to know the truth and we're going to be free. Period. Right? That's awesome. I'm all getting pumped. You will know the truth. Number seven, the sword of the spirit. Hebrews 4, 12 to 13. For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than a double-edged sword. It penetrates, even dividing the soul and the spirit. It means it's good on both fronts. It's good for spiritual battles and battles against your flesh. It, it separates joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of whom we must give an account. We have God's word. Word, and it is an offensive weapon. When Jesus was being tempted, he quickly was reminding Satan of God's word. And Satan had no rebuttal for the truth of God's word, right? Nothing to say. What was that? Oh yeah, you know. He knows that God is in control. And when we use God's word against him in that attack, it just... Straight up, if we have God's truth and word in us, we can use those truths and promises and things that it says against the enemy and we can put him in his place by speaking that truth and it's like stabbing him in the heart with a sword. What, you want to attack me? Guess what God's word says. He's like, okay, 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 okay. I'm out of here, right? He's got nothing on you. Number eight, pray in the spirit on all occasions. And I'm gonna ask the band to come. If you would, please. Pray in all occasions. You know, we need to make it a habit of also when we are having hardship because I'm not strong enough to do it on my own, right? Sometimes I give in. Sometimes I mess up. Sometimes I, you know, my righteousness is a, is a filthy rag, right? So where do we go to fight? We hit our knees we close our eyes and we spend some time with the one who rules it all. All the time. Right? When God's involved, it's a game changer. And we need to hit our knees and fight our battles in prayer and being connected to God. It's not even the words that we're saying. Guys, it's not even the words that we're saying. It's the connection that we have with the Father. Right? That's the difference maker. And so when we hit our knees, it's not, you know, saying the, the right prayer. Oh, if I could just say the right prayer. It's, it's like, I'm connected to you, Lord. Have your way, Lord. And it's just a beautiful relationship and a connection that you have. You have to fight your battles that way all the time. So when temptation comes, it's like, God, help me. Because I can't do it. Right? Bring God in. But sometimes we're like a little bit tempted and we don't want to pray like God help me because we know like I still might give in here. I don't know. Right? So I'm not going to bring you into this, God. I'm just going to see where this goes. Right? We've got to bring God into it. When you find yourself in that temptation, cry out to God. Crucify your flesh. Battles won. Amen. If we have that mindset, I'm going to stand. I'm going to be connected. I'm going to win. You know, the enemy is going to come at you this week. He's going to try to tempt you. He's going to try to rock you, get you off guard. He's going to try and attack you, right? But we're going to be ready. We're going to be alert, sober mind. We're going to be ready. And no matter what he brings, we know it is nothing in the scope of our eternity in our you know, relationship with God that is nothing. Because we're kingdom minded. Christ was kingdom minded. Let's be kingdom minded this morning. Pray in all occasions. 
in every situation, no matter what you're going through, no matter how bleak or hard the situation seems, get God involved. Pray and let him in. And number nine, the cross of Christ is one of our greatest weapons that we have. You see, sometimes we blow it. Sometimes we allow ourselves to give in. But in that moment, we can retreat to the place of safety, the sanctuary that is the cross. Run to the cross of Christ. The gospel of Pete fitted with the readiness that when I'm weak, I'm running to Jesus, I'm running to the cross, I'm asking for forgiveness, and I'm gonna get his righteousness put back on me and I'm right back in it. Quick to rush into the fight. Run to the cross of Christ. The good news is, is if you blow it, it's not the end. There's a reset. It's the cross, we just run to it and we get, re, get, re, our, get our victory given back to us. Number 10, the name of Jesus. The name above all names. I told you the enemy doesn't shudder at Pete Benson's name. He laughs, ha! That guy's a fool. Yeah, probably true. But you know what? The name of Jesus though, he shudders at that. He shudders at that because that is the final authority. So use it. Church, I'm looking at you, use it. Use the name of Jesus against the enemy and he will flee because he's scared of that name. Right, when you're, when you're young, you're like, oh yeah, well I'm telling my dad. And they're like, ah, oh, don't tell your dad. And the kid, you know, we're gonna go tell our dad. We're gonna use the name of Jesus. We're gonna get the person who's gonna come and set things right. We're gonna come and we're gonna get them. Use the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, I will not give in to that. In the name of Jesus, you will not have my finances. In the name of Jesus, I will be healed. In the name of Jesus, I will be victoriously. Use the name of Jesus. Don't say, stop, devil, leave me alone. I don't like you. He's gonna be like, good. But when you say, in the name of Jesus, kid, he's like, oh, oh, all right, all right, right? Use your weapons. They come from the Lord. All right, this is how I'm ending done. I wanted, so like, I was like, Lord, how do I close this out? I wanted to, I wanted to read the scripture over you. But before I do, I'm going to ask that if you are ready to be enlisted into God's army, if you're ready to fight the good fight, if you're ready to put on the armor of God, if you're ready to be connected to Jesus, I'm going to ask you to stand. That's you. You do what you want, right? You get to choose. If you're ready and you're like, let's do this. I'm not gonna stay out of fight. I know that's impossible anyway. So I'm not gonna pretend like I can do it. I wanna read the scripture over you. Second Chronicles 20, 15. This is what the Lord says to you. If you're standing, the Lord is speaking this to you. Do not be, or do not be afraid or discouraged by this vast army you see out in the world. The opposition that comes against you, do not be scared. Do not be discouraged because of it. For the battle is not yours, but God's. Remember, when the devil tries to attack you, I, this is not Pete Benson, guys, I'm reading scripture. Remember, when the devil tries to attack you, he is indirectly trying to attack God, and we all know that God wins every time. Come on now. That is your heritage. That is who you are. That is the promise that God has spoken over you. So go fight, but fight victoriously. And as you're fighting, you know that others are experiencing the same thing. But you know what? That doesn't matter because Christ is winning. And his kingdom in due time will be revealed and you will be lifted up. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you, God, and we thank you. 
God, we thank you for the weapons of warfare that you've given us. The name of Jesus, the, the belt of truth, the gospel of peace, the, the breastplate of righteousness, the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, the connection we have with you. Lord, knowing that, that we are fighting a defeated foe, God, we thank you for these things. In the name of Jesus, God, and we come against our attackers in the name of Jesus and declare that your kingdom come, that your will be done, that it will overcome the kingdom of darkness it already has and it's gonna be good from now in eternity on and on and on and I will not be shaken in Jesus name and Lord now I pray for all those in this room that you would bless them and keep them you would make your face shine upon them that you would be gracious to them that you would lift up your countenance upon them and give them what we talked about peace in Jesus name I speak peace over these people today in their lives in Jesus name Jesus name. God bless you guys. Thanks for coming this morning. We'll see you right back here next week. Altars are open if you'd like to worship, pray, do some battle, hit your knees, whatever you need. We're here for you. Go in the grace of God.